Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining our prostate cancer treatment overview and options webinar. We'll start with a few housekeeping items, and then I'm going to introduce our speakers. So first, your attendance tonight is completely anonymous to other attendees. No one can see your face or your name, and any comments or questions can only be seen by myself and our speakers. If you wish to ask a question, please move your cursor to bring up the chat box at the lower portion of your screen, and we'll try to answer as many questions as we can at the conclusion of our presentation. Our presentation tonight will last for approximately one hour and will be presented by urologist Dr. Paul Yanover and radiation oncologist Dr. Par Mehta of Europartners LLC in Chicago. Dr. Yanover is a board certified urologist who specializes in prostate cancer, BPH, kidney stones, bladder cancer, kidney cancer, and laparoscopic surgery. After earning his bachelor's degree at Indiana University with a double major in biology and history, he went on to Mount Sinai School of Medicine in New York City, followed by residency programs in surgery and urology at Loyola University Medical Center in Maywood, Illinois. Dr. Yanover has done extensive research in urology and has been published in numerous clinical journals. In addition, he is currently a clinical assistant professor of urology at the University of Illinois at Chicago College of Medicine as well as the Chief of Urology at both Advocate Illinois Masonic Hospital and Amida Presence St. Joseph Hospital. Dr. Mehta is a board-certified radiation oncologist specializing in the treatment of prostate cancer. He possesses expertise and advanced training in intensity-modulated radiation therapy, image-guided radiation therapy, and prostate brachytherapy. Additionally, he is an expert in utilizing the Calypso 4D localization system. After earning his bachelor's degree in engineering from the University of Michigan, Dr. Mehta entered the Medical Scholars Program at the University of Illinois, where he completed an MD as well as an MBA degree. He completed his residency in radiation oncology at Rush University Medical Center and entered into a brachytherapy fellowship program at Beth Israel Medical Center in New York City. During this time, he completed research which has been published in several clinical journal journals. Dr. Yanover will be covering the first portion of our presentation tonight, but thank you both for joining us. So Dr. Yanover, if you could please unmute your mic, I will turn it over to you. Excellent, thank you very much, Jack. And uh, thank you very much to Boston Scientific for providing us uh, this educational platform. Um, I think this is a, a sort of a unique time and, and I'm glad that we're able to uh, facilitate these uh, types of interactions with people to to sort of spread the word about prostate cancer and prostate cancer treatment. So thank you very much. Uh, so with tonight's program, uh, we're going to tackle a couple things with prostate uh, cancer. First, we're gonna talk a little bit about the anatomy of the prostate. Uh, we're gonna talk a little bit about prostate cancer uh, statistics, its diagnosis, and of course its treatment. And, uh, and we have with us uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Dr. Mehta, whose uh, expertise in radiation uh, will provide us a lot of insight as to some of the radiation uh, treatment options, which are really important uh, in our armamentarium of, of dealing with prostate cancer. And I'm uh, very proud and honored to be a colleague and, and partner with Dr. Mehta for many years. Uh, and he's treated a lot of, uh, of the patients at Neural Partners and, and does really a superb job of that. So I, ho I hope this is a useful and, and educational tool for all of our participants, and uh, certainly looking forward to some uh, of the interesting questions uh, that we can ho uh, hopefully uh, uh, answer at the end of this broadcast. Uh, of course, uh, one of the, uh, the other things that we're gonna be talking about, last but not least, of course, is the space or hydrogel. Again, this is something that uh, we've, uh, a technology we've employed at Euro Partners very successfully. Uh, for hundreds of our patients, uh, in large part because of Dr. Mehta uh, and his championing uh, this uh, technology, which has uh, helped us minimize and, and eliminate some of the side effects uh, uh, from treatment. So I'm very excited to be able to, to talk about that and of course to, to hear Dr. Mehta um, uh, describe that new technology uh, for all of us. So the anatomy of the prostate is, is really important to understand when you are trying to figure out um, uh, not only how do we go about diagnosing prostate cancer, uh, 
how we go about treating prostate cancer, but also it, if you understand the anatomy, you can better understand um, how uh, the potential treatment side effects uh, can occur. Um, as you can see here in this picture, uh, there's the rectum, bladder, and prostate uh, that are labeled here. And you can also see that the urethra runs right through the prostate. So the prostate's a, typically described as a sort of a walnut-shaped organ. It's of various sizes. Um, it can be as small as a, uh, as a small clementine. Of course, in some patients, it can be very uh, rather large. Um, but the issue that the prostate sits right on top of the rectum is very important, and it sits right at the outlet of the bladder. Um, it's sort of what I call sort of a crowded neighborhood. And, uh, uh, and again, as we go about either uh, surgically treating the prostate uh, for, its, for cancer or giving radiation to the prostate, you have to understand that uh, there are urinary and bowel issues as well as sexual issues um, that can occur, and that's because of uh, the anatomy and, and the anat anatomic relationships. It's also an important, uh, the question I received a lot is what does the prostate do? Why is it there? Well, it's a gland that uh, uh, provides, uh, it's essentially, it's a fertility organ that provides some of the uh, fluids uh, during ejaculation and uh, its only purpose is for fertility. And therefore, uh, uh, particularly later in life, it's not an organ that is uh, needed. And that's why we can either surgically remove it or irradiate it or uh, do other things to the prostate. Next slide. So, uh, you know, prostate cancer is one of those diseases that uh, is still shrouded in a little bit of mystery, uh, both for doctors and patients alike. Um, a man's risk can be in overall lifetime risk, could be somewhere between one and eight and one and nine uh, for, all coming, for all comers, essentially for all patients. Now, some patients have a higher risk because of either their family history. If you have a family history of prostate cancer, particularly in a first degree relative, that lifetime risk of developing prostate cancer is gonna go up. Also, uh, we know that in African-American men, uh, we're not exactly sure why, but if you're an African-American male, we also know that it harbors a risk factor and therefore your lifetime risk is, is higher. We also know that uh, age in, in some respects is a risk factor. So that we know that as you get older, the, the chances of developing prostate cancer go up as well. Uh, unfortunately, prostate cancer is the second leading cause of cancer death in American men behind lung cancer. But in these statistics, uh, we have to dive a little deeper to fully understand prostate cancer because it is what we call a heterogeneous disease. It's a very, uh, it's not a one size fits all. It's not a black and white disease. It actually comes in lots of different, what I like to explain, lots of different flavors. Um, and that's important to understand because that that impacts how we approach prostate cancer. And in the next slide, you'll sort of understand some of that. Next slide, please. So in 2018 statistics, which are fairly consistent with uh, uh, 2019 and 2020, um, we, we diagnosed in the United States about 165,000 men uh, with prostate cancer. But if you look on the next line on the slide, you'll see that there are about 30,000 deaths from prostate cancer per year. So you can see there's a large spread between how many cases, uh, what's the incidence of the disease and the mortality of the disease. And because there's a big spread, that means that there's a lot of patients who either don't ever uh, have lethal disease or are curable. And uh, the, that's one of the success stories is how we've approached prostate cancer, we are able to diagnose and treat and cure a large portion of men that come through our doors. Um, unfortunately, there are uh, men who come through our doors who the disease has already advanced. Uh, it's already uh, too aggressive, as we say, the horse is already out of the barn. Um, but the other side of that is we also have a lot of disease that actually never needs to be treated, never needs to be cured. And that's a bit of a confusing uh, notion, particularly for those of the uninitiated, that not all cancer is lethal and some cancer that comes through our door is not curable. And what we're really trying to do now in the modern era of prostate cancer is differentiate and try to find the men who don't ever need to be treated and separate them out from 
the men who it's already too late, and then it's the men in between. Are those the ones that we need to really um, uh, be aggressive about diagnosing and treating? And of course, we wanna treat all the aspects of prostate cancer, but there are a large cohort of men who come through our doors that, that, that get diagnosed who never need treatment. And again, that's an idea that has uh, taken a uh, hold within the urologic community, but is hard sometimes to communicate and, uh, and get our patients to understand. But a large portion of those men that are in between, those are the men that are gonna be offered curative uh, therapy, such as uh, surgery, radiation, and we'll talk about that uh, a little bit. Um, the, the, the nice thing though is the cure rates are very high. So for that select man who were able to, to uh, diagnose in time, were able to uh, get lead time on the, uh, the diagnosis, we're able to cure a, uh, an incredibly high percentage of those patients. And even uh, in, in our modern era, even for those patients that we are not able to actually cure who have recurrent disease, sometimes we have an, a second opportunity to cure them or suppress their disease for an almost indefinite period of time. And uh, when we make prostate cancer a sort of a chronic disease, even if we can't fully cure it, sometimes that disease will just linger in a non-symptomatic uh, non way, um, which doesn't harm the patient, which is, uh, uh, can be just as important as, as finding a cure for those patients. Next slide. So how do we find uh, those patients? Well, uh, screening hasn't really changed very much in the last uh, 30, 35 years. Um, screening uh, programs are, are really important. Uh, it's something that we do a lot of here at Euro Partners, um, and I believe very strongly in screening aggressively in the right population. Um, so how do we screen? Well, there's two things that are uh, sort of components of the screening uh, regimen. A PSA test, which is, stands for a prostate-specific antigen uh, test. That's a blood test. There's a couple different forms of that, but they're all basically the same. And that should be done typically annually, oftentimes by a primary care physician. And for most men, uh, that can be started around age 50. And after about age 70 to 75, we don't think that uh, aggressive screening is always necessary in most circumstances. So that sweet spot of screening is around the ages between 50 and 75, unless there's a family history of prostate cancer. If you have a family history of prostate cancer or if you're African-American, as I said earlier at the beginning in the introduction, those are patients who have a higher risk factor. And for those patients, we think screening should probably initiate around age 40. That should be coupled, uh, the blood test should be coupled with a digital rectal exam. That's where, and again, going back to that anatomy slide, you see that the prostate sits right on top of the rectum. And therefore, we can feel part of the prostate by doing a digital rectal exam. And those two components are really important. You're, what you're looking for in the rectal exam, how big is the prostate? Is there anatomy issues? Is there nodules? Are there areas of tenderness? Is there asymmetry? Is there a part of the prostate that is larger than the other? It's kind of a clue sometimes that there may be a tumor growing within it. And you combine the PSA testing with digital rectal exam, and, uh, and we have a, a fairly good way to diagnose prostate cancer, but it's not perfect. Sometimes tumors are missed, and thankfully nowadays we have other modalities such as MRI to image the prostate and sort of help us find uh, these tumors. Non-screen detected prostate cancer is something we don't thankfully see very often. That's when a patient is diagnosed during the workup of other symptoms pain in the pelvis, urinary obstruction, urinary bleeding, sometimes pain in the bones. And that's typically, if we find cancer in those cases, unfortunately is a case where it's advanced disease. And almost always those patients are not uh, uh, able to be cured. Their disease is already metastasized and spread um, either locally or distant. Um, and those are patients we can manage, but oftentimes cure is, uh, is not within reach for those types of patients. And that's why screening regimens are so very important, particularly for patients who are gonna benefit from some sort of uh, curative therapy. Um, when we have a uh, suspicion of disease, then what we have to do is a prostate biopsy. Prostate biopsies uh, in 2020, the only way to confirm the existence and the severity of a prostate cancer. Typically, uh, a needle will go into the prostate 
uh, anywhere between 20, or sorry, 12 and 20 times um, after a local block is performed. And tissue is sampled and removed from the prostate. And that, that sample is then looked at under the microscope by a pathologist who specializes in these things. And that's how uh, the prostate cancer can be diagnosed. Next slide. So here are two pictures of ways that we do the biopsy. Um, this picture shows uh, the patient laying on their back, but typically the patient's on their side during this uh, procedure. What we do is we place a, a, a probe, an ultrasound probe, um, typically in the rectum. And again, that's because the prostate sits right on top of the rectum. That ultrasound probe allows us to identify where the prostate is, how big is the prostate, it allows us to insert a small needle next to the prostate to deliver some anesthetic so we can pr we, uh, provide what's called a local block to provide some pain control during the procedure and make it a little less unpleasant. It's also guiding us as to where to go and where to place the needle. We can do this really two ways. We can do it through the transrectal approach where the needle goes through the rectum into the prostate. That's fairly standard, but of course, as you can imagine, that also raises the risk of some infection. We have to give antibiotics during the uh, procedure and infection risk is very real. Thankfully it's low, but it can be severe and it's some of the things that we struggle with because we can produce infection uh, during the biopsy um, and, and that can cause uh, some sickness for our patients. To eliminate that, we've now developed something called the transperineal approach. That's on the, the uh, picture on the left. And that's where uh, with the needle guide, up against what we call the perineum, through the skin and avoiding going through the rectum, we're able to sample the prostate. Um, we can do that as particularly when the patient's uh, uh, with anesthetic, we can actually provide a lot more sampling of the prostate. We do that called a, a saturation biopsy, which we'll employ sometimes. We're actually now in the era of fusing an MRI image with these two te uh, biopsy techniques to help uh, improve our diagnostic yield. Uh, but either way, uh, in order to make the diagnosis of prostate cancer, we do need to have a tissue diagnosis and uh, we do need to sample the prostate in one of these two ways. Next slide. So when uh, prostate cancer is detected, uh, there are some important pieces of information on that pathology report that we look at to help guide us in what to do for the patient and help to guide the patient. Um, those, those key pillars of the grading and staging system are what we call the Gleason score. Well, Dr. Gleason was a pathologist at the VA. Many years ago, developed a schema, basically where he uh, looked at the glands, the prostate cancer glands under the microscope and described uh, the severity of the disease, how aggressive that disease is. And that scale sort of developed and evolved over time and that Gleason score, which is nowadays, is going to be a number somewhere between six and 10. And that number, the higher the number, the more, more severe, more aggressive that disease is. Well, that is a confusing schema because it's only between six and 10. So recently, a group uh, within urology had advocated rescaling that to grade grouping, which is a scale between one and five one being the most uh, non-aggressive, what I call the wimpiest type of disease, and five being the most aggressive uh, type of disease. And that scale gives us an idea, again, when I was talking earlier about disease that does not need to be treated, disease that is beyond uh, the ability to cure, and those diseases in between, that grade grouping or Gleason score helps us figure out where on that spectrum the patient uh, cancer lies. We also look at the T stage, and that is a part of a TNM uh, schema where we look at the, uh, how the prostate feels, if there's any other imaging and, and, and clinical exam, and that gives us an estimate of the extent of the tumor. Unfortunately, uh, that is not particularly accurate, but it can give us some clues, and it's really most useful, I think, uh, in very advanced disease where you can actually feel the disease. When you can feel a lump, you can actually feel sometimes for patients that has extended outside of the prostate. And if we have a notion that it's extended outside the prostate, so we, we always worry sometimes that those patients are beyond a cure. Um, thankfully, with some very advanced techniques, doctors like Dr. Meta can even turn a patient with locally advanced disease and even have an opportunity to cure those patients. 
And of course, we take the PSA test uh, into account, and that helps us give a patient a risk stratification. So typically, when the PSA is less than four, four between four and 10 and greater than 10 are so, sort of key benchmarks that the higher the PSA, the higher the risk is that that patient is beyond cure. And the higher the risk of the patient uh, in the risk schema, the higher the risk, the means that we have to layer on more therapy in order to, to obtain a cure uh, for the patient. Um, as noted below in the, in the slide, we take PSA velocity into account. So what that is, is if you have multiple PSA tests, which a lot of patients do uh, as part of screening over time, if you have several PSA values over time, if that PSA is very stable versus if the PSA is rapidly rising, that can give us some clue as to what we call the phenotype or how aggressive the disease is, how that disease is gonna behave. Um, we have genomic testing. Um, we have uh, the volume of tumor, which we can estimate uh, both by the pathology as well as with an MRI. And of course, we have other risk assessment tools available to us. And as things get more sophisticated, those tools become uh, more valuable to us in trying to figure out where, again, on that spectrum does that patient lie and what therapies are going to be best for our patient. Next slide. So in, in sort of broad strokes, when a patient has prostate cancer, I, I tell them, hey, look, uh, this is what the disease is. I give them his risk stratification. I give all that information. We go through that uh, piece by piece. And at the end of the day, what we need to do is just take all that information and decide um, in what bucket is that going to uh, place the patient uh, uh, as far as their risk uh, factors. And then we take what risk factors they have and what uh, risk um, status they, they are. And we say, look, uh, do you need treatment or if you don't? And if you do need treatment, uh, what kind of treatment are you going to get? And in this slide, it sort of distills it down into sort of three big buckets. You have active surveillance, which it's, as his name would imply, those are patients who uh, don't necessarily need curative therapy and, be, and can be monitored. Those are the patients who are typically in very low or low risk uh, situations where we think that we can actually keep an eye on the tumor and not have to deliver curative therapy, but it's active surveillance. It's not just sitting by and doing nothing. We actually have to actively monitor the disease to make sure that it does not get uh, aggressive and out of control. And if we don't do active surveillance, we have two main therapies. We have forms of radiation therapy, which Dr. Mehta will talk to us about, and we have forms of therapy. Uh, sorry, uh, surgery is our therapy. Uh, that's what urologists will typically employ. Uh, as urologists, what we can do is we can actually do a radical prostatectomy. Sometimes we do that with the removal of lymph nodes. We can nowadays, and this is how it's mostly deployed these days, is that we can do it either in a minimally invasive way through laparoscopy or more often using what we call a robotic platform. And that's where we remove the entire prostate gland. We take out typically sometimes some of the lymph nodes, and then we have to reconnect the bladder to the urethra. It's called an anastomosis. So it's both what we call extir extirpative. We remove a gland, and then we have to do a reconstruction. And of course, uh, it's delicate surgery, and it's uh, reserved for patients who can withstand the rigors of surgery. If a patient has a lot of other medical problems, or has anatomy issues, or have had multiple surgeries in the past, oftentimes we'll shy away from actually doing surgery for those patients. And oftentimes those patients will end up in Dr. Meta's clinic so that he can deliver radiation for those patients so they can avoid uh, surgery to remove their prostate. Of course, Dr. Meta will talk to you about all the radiation options. That's much beyond my expertise. But oftentimes, we'll, Dr. Meta and I will work together in doing things like brachytherapy uh, which is an implantation of a radioactive seeds into the prostate, which is a little bit of a hybrid. It's a, not a surgical procedure, but it's done under anesthesia in an operative suite. Active surveillance is one of the, the, the things that um, uh, we've adopted uh, pretty aggressively in urology in the last uh, 10 years. And it's this, this notion that, again, patients, not all patients that come to our clinic with the diagnosis of prostate cancer need curative therapy. 
it, a lot of those patients will go on for active surveillance, but some subset of those men on active surveillance will then go on to develop prostate cancer that does need treatment. And so oftentimes a patient will be on active surveillance and ultimately end up in the bucket of either radiation therapy or with surgery. And the whole idea with active surveillance is to try to avoid therapy so that you can avoid some of the therapy related morbidities, such as bowel, urinary, and sexual dysfunction that can occur whether you do radiation therapy or surgery to the prostate. We call that sort of the trifecta of uh, quality of life symptoms uh, associated with therapy. Whenever we have a patient with prostate cancer who we think needs curative intent, I talk to a patient and say, look, our goal is to, to cure you of disease. That's going to be our number one goal. But in trying to achieve that cure, I want to try to also preserve what we talked about, that trifecta of quality of life, which are your bowel, uh, your, your bowel function, your sexual function, and your urinary uh, uh, function. When patients get treatment, either with radiation or surgery, there's always uh, the risk that there, there can be bladder problems. And we can have either irritative urinary problems or incontinence, uh, where uh, the patient is no longer able to hold back or control their urinary function. Sexual function uh, can be impacted with prostate cancer therapy because, as I mentioned earlier, it's a fertility organ, but it's also involved in sexual function. It's also important to note that along the, the prostate, uh, within millimeters, run the nerves that help um, are part of the erectile uh, 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 function. And if those nerves get injured or damaged uh, during either radiation or surgery, that can significantly or completely impair the ability to get and uh, obtain and maintain erections, and therefore uh, sexual function can be negatively impacted by any of the therapies. And of course, the, as we noted before, the rectum runs right along the prostate. And so during surgery, the rectum can be injured. And during the delivery of radiation therapy, uh, we can have radiation-induced bowel problems. And again, uh, that's something we, we try desperately to avoid. Uh, radiation oncologists like Dr. Meda are expert in trying to avoid the delivery of radiation to the rectum. And uh, devices like the space ore gel, which we'll talk about later, help uh, decrease or eliminate uh, the radiation being delivered to the bowel and uh, to try to minimize or eliminate any bowel problems that you might have from the uh, therapy. Next slide. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to my esteemed colleague, uh, Dr. Mehta, uh, whose expertise in radiation um, uh, will, uh, will be able to uh, tell us um, what the radiation oncologist does in trying to cure prostate cancer. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Dr. Yanover. Thank you, uh, Boston Scientific. Um, so again, I'm Dr. Meta. Um, I am board certified in radiation oncology, uh, and my training actually involved treatment of all types of cancer, but for the past uh, seven and a half years now, I've been exclusively treating prostate cancer for urinal partners, and uh, we typically treat uh, somewhere around three to 400 patients uh, a year, and I probably see somewhere around five to 600 uh, new patients uh, every year. Uh, the goal today, of course, is to go through uh, radiation for prostate cancer and uh, also talk some about some of the side effects uh, and, of course, review uh, the space OAR um, uh, perirectal hydrogel. Uh, next slide, please. So the first question, I guess, is, you know, what is radiation? Well, when we think of treating uh, cancer, there's typically three ways of treating it. There's surgery, uh, there's drugs, and there's radiation. Uh, fortunately for prostate cancer, if you find it before it's spread, uh, we typically do not have to use uh, chemotherapy. Um, the typical treatments would involve uh, either watching it, radiation, um, or surgery. Now radiation, because it's not chemotherapy, doesn't have the typical side effects of hair loss uh, and nausea and vomiting. It really only affects the area that we're aiming. And in this case, we're talking about treating the prostate. Uh, what we're doing is either delivering a beam of ionizing radiation through uh, many different techniques uh, to kill the cancer, uh, or we are actually inserting radioactive material uh, to where the tumor is, uh, in this case, in the prostate. Uh, so the effects of radiation are basically limited to where we're aiming. 
And in this case, we're aiming at the prostate. And as Dr. Yonavor uh, mentioned previously, uh, the anatomy is actually a, a very tight space. Uh, and unfortunately, we have the bladder, uh, the rectum, the nerves that control our erections, the blood vessels that help us have erections, uh, all within very close proximity of the prostate. And those are uh, in the area where they can be damaged by the radiation. Uh, and it is really a balancing act. What we're trying to do is achieve uh, the same, if not similar, rates of cure as surgery, and hopefully uh, decreasing the potential side effects. Uh, so just like Dr. Yonover mentioned, not everybody is a candidate for having their prostate removed. And the goal of radiation therapy for prostate cancer is to try and provide the same uh, level of cure and treatment uh, while decreasing the possible side effects. Um, next slide, please. So there are several different ways of delivering radiation therapy. So uh, there's external radiation, which means there's a machine that's delivering the treatment, and then there's internal radiation therapy where we are actually placing radiation inside. Uh, this is where it gets a very confusing, I think, for a lot of our patients because there's so many different options and trying to figure out you know, which options are the best ones. And um, I do think for, for individual patients, it's always worth having a discussion with the radiation oncologist to really go over which, which therapies are actually appropriate uh, for your specific uh, disease based on the aggressiveness and uh, based on other medical problems that may be involved here. Uh, but to, to make it quite simple, uh, in external beam radiation therapy, we, we think of an older technique called 3D conformal radiation therapy, which uh, is rarely used for prostate cancer, uh, in America at least. Um, most of the time we are using things like intensity modulated radiation therapy, along with uh, some form of image guided radiation therapy. And uh, what the intensely modulated radiation therapy involves is, uh, is a big machine that's uh, in, in, a, in a big room uh, where it delivers a treatment. Uh, the patient is typically laying down on the table, just like in the previous picture, uh, and the machine uh, generates a beam that treats the cancer. Uh, image guided is actually something we use in addition to IMRT. Uh, what that does is that helps us make sure that we're actually hitting the right spot. So typically there will be some combination of IMRT and IGRT. The question is how often do you get a treatment? One of the biggest complaints about radiation therapy, uh, at least when it's done conventionally, is it tends to be a long treatment course. So unlike surgery where you go in and you have your prostate removed, uh, and the healing takes place at home. With radiation therapy, it's typically a longer treatment course, typically Monday to Friday uh, for a period of many weeks. Uh, there are some different ways that we've found that we can shorten the course for appropriate patients. Uh, one of them is the stereotactic body radiation therapy where um, we can perhaps get the treatment done in as few as five or six treatments. Uh, although again, this is only appropriate for select patients. Uh, one of the other emerging technologies is to use uh, something called a proton beam, uh, which is a different form of delivering radiation to the cancer, uh, hopefully uh, reducing side effects. Um, these are uh, techniques that are being evaluated, uh, and hopefully, you know, the goal again is to cure the cancer uh, while limiting any possible side effects for our patients. As Dr. Yonover mentioned before, uh, most patients who are diagnosed with prostate cancer are going to live for an awfully long time. And the goal is not only for them to be cancer free, but also to have a very good quality of life. For some patients, uh, they may choose to actually have the radiation placed internally. Um, and that's something called brachytherapy. We have a couple different ways of doing that, LDR, HDR. Um, the concept is the same. It's delivering the radiation but in these cases, we may be able to do it even quicker, perhaps in even just one treatment for appropriate patients. Uh, can we go to the next slide? So the problem with radiation is that it affects the area that we're aiming. And the goal, of course, is to eliminate the cancer. In order to eliminate the cancer, as of now, we treat the entire prostate gland. And to make sure that we're hitting it, we have to include something called a margin which means we treat a little rim around the prostate to make sure that we're getting all of the cancer. And the problem comes back to the anatomy. So in this picture here, um, you can see that these are CAT scan pictures. Uh, we can see that the prostate is again, right next to the rectum, right next to the bladder. And unfortunately, uh, the penile bulb is uh, immediately underneath it. 
uh, and that's involved in our sexual function. Uh, and we're actually not very far away from the anal sphincter either. That's where our control is for our bowel movements. So radiation can affect all of these uh, areas. Uh, today we're focusing on the rectum, but quite real briefly, I just wanted to say that uh, unfortunately the bladder neck kind of extends uh, into the prostate. And so uh, you really can't avoid uh, the bottom most part of the bladder. And most patients will have some urinary symptoms as they go through radiation, usually involving frequent urination or urgent urination, uh, waking up more at nighttime, that is extremely common. Um, they may also feel some fatigue, which is a result of radiation. Uh, and then of course they will possibly have some rectal side effects, which is what we're going to focus on today. Next slide, please. So how often does rectal toxicity actually happen? Now, this is something that is variable depending on which studies you look at. Uh, in the older days, we used to kind of quote somewhere around 15 to 20% of patients would have uh, some significant uh, rectal side effects, uh, and even more would have urinary side effects. Uh, this is a uh, retrospective analysis uh, that was looking at patients who were having uh, that SBRT, which is the very high dose um, uh, treatment, uh, which is delivered over only five treatments. One of the problems with treating very high doses at one time is the fear that you will permanently damage the structures that are next to the organ being targeted, in this case, the bladder and the rectum. Uh, so looking at toxicity, uh, you know, in side effects, we think of two different ways of describing side effects. One is what happens during the treatment. So most patients will have some side effects during radiation. We call that early toxicity. So that would be uh, the common problems with urinary and bowel complaints and fatigue. But those should really dissipate over time. And my take on this is, uh, you know, we are doing a pretty serious treatment and we expect that there will be some consequences. And I can deal with those consequences if they last uh, for a period of a couple months. What we're really trying to avoid is having late toxicity, which means something that may be with our patients, uh, perhaps for the rest of their life, and or require more interventions uh, over time as they deal with these bad side effects. Uh, so, you know, fortunately, the technology has evolved where most patients will not have significant side effects in the long run. Uh, but if you're in that group that does have these problems, unfortunately, it's a long-term issue, uh, and it really does affect quality of life. Uh, for example, if we look at the table here uh, with, with the chart, uh, we can see that in this particular study, they found that uh, late toxicity uh, without using space OAR was 32% uh, in terms of urinary side effects and only 15% with space OAR. Uh, but if you really look at the rectal complications, the gastrointestinal problems, it was 6% uh, without the space OR and only 1% uh, with the space OR. Next slide. So, you know, the reason for the hydrogel. Uh, is because we really can't avoid uh, the rectum if we're treating the prostate. Uh, it is right next to it. There's a very thin layer of fat uh, between it, uh, which is typically only a millimeter or two. Uh, it can be slightly bigger in some patients, but usually not very thick. Um, the problem with radiation is if we're doing external radiation, we are treating a moving object. The prostate is not attached to any bone. It's attached only to the bladder. And the bladder is filling up, which causes movement. We have breathing. We also have digestion happening. And the rectum actually expands and contracts all the time. So how do you hit a moving target? The way we hit it is we have to treat a wider area than the target itself. And that typically includes uh, the front part of the rectum. Next, next slide, please. So the concept of space or uh, is to identify the rectum as the organ at risk, and how can we decrease the radiation to that organ. Uh, the complications that, we're, that I was mentioning that can happen when we do have rectal problems uh, can be bleeding, can be frequent bowel movements, urgency. In rare cases, you can even have pain and even form a connection uh, between the rectum uh, and the skin, uh, or the rectum and the prostate, or the rectum and the bladder, uh, which can really create uh, uh, almost an emergency type of situation. 
Uh, and as I mentioned before, the goal is to uh, maintain quality of life. Uh, our patients will be alive for a very long time and hopefully be cured. Uh, we don't want them having problems down the road. Next slide. So the benefit of space or is it is a thin layer that goes in between the prostate and the rectum, and it physically creates a space between the prostate and the rectum. So instead of having that one to three millimeters of distance between the prostate and the rectum, we're typically able to get somewhere around 10 millimeters or uh, between a quarter and a half inch. And what that does is when we do the radiation, when we add that margin around the prostate, instead of treating the front part of the rectum, we're actually treating the hydrogel. Uh, and uh, this gel will dissolve over a period of three to six months. Uh, so when we do MRIs or we do scans down the road, uh, you basically can't see it. Uh, so it's really only there temporarily. Uh, the way we put it in uh, is through a single needle insertion, which can be done either with local anesthetic uh, or with some anesthesia. Uh, and that just depends on, on the facility where you're receiving uh, the insertion. Next slide, please. So just some brief uh, factoids about Spaceor. Um, it is uh, non-toxic. Uh, it's biocompatible. As I mentioned before, it absorbs uh, relatively quickly. It's mainly made out of water. Uh, patients always ask me, you know, will we feel something when I put it in there? Uh, it is a thicker layer than what's there normally. Uh, most of my patients will tell me maybe for a day or two that they will notice uh, some pressure down there, like a feeling to have a bowel movement. Uh, I have uh, done, I think, over 700 cases by now, uh, and I really have not had uh, a significant problem uh, placing it or patients uh, uh, describing any uh, severe side effects of placing it. Um, it has been studied pretty extensively. Uh, and again, the goal is to put the space uh, in between the prostate and the rectum. And it's, it's kind of interesting, but you know, the goal has always been to reduce the damage to the rectum. Uh, but in most of the studies, they've also shown some improvement uh, in urinary symptoms and even in sexual function uh, compared to not using Spacer. And uh, there's a, some theories about that. My personal theory is that, you know, when we, when we try to design our radiation treatments, uh, we have all of these different organs that we are trying to protect while still uh, maximizing the dose to the prostate. And our software uh, involves, you know, optimizing things. And uh, when I have a thick layer in between the prostate and the rectum, the dose to the rectum is reduced so severely that we really don't have to worry about the rectal dose uh, because it's really just not an issue. Uh, and the software programs can optimize by decreasing the dose uh, to the bladder uh, and to the nerve bundles. Uh, next slide, please. So basically, by having that space there, uh, the goal is to reduce all of the complications that arise from radiation, which again, involves rectal complications, urinary complications, uh, and sexual complications, uh, with the ultimate goal of having you know, your patient cured and having a very good quality of life. Next slide. So again, you know, this has been extensively studied. There are over 75 uh, peer-reviewed publications. Um, most uh, leading cancer centers are using Spaceor. Uh, over 50,000 patients have been treated. Uh, and one of the big issues we had early on uh, is when the FDA approved it, uh, there was some financial concern. Uh, fortunately, Medicare is now reimbursing it, and uh, definitely a lot of insurers have uh, found that this benefit to their patients uh, is worth the cost uh, of the Spaceor hydrogel. Next slide, please. So with that, I'd like to turn it back over to Jack. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mehta and Dr. Janover. Uh, that concludes the presentation portion of tonight's webinar.